Hey guys, Marcel is back here. Um, of course, we are joined by one of the owners. I think it's one of the most heated discussions or topics right now for a lot of people involved uh, in the LCS to talk about like the ecosystem, right? So I'm sure you have seen Reginald's interview and I think a lot of others have. Probably if you haven't seen it, you should check out uh, Scarra's interview with Reginald on our side, of course. And yeah, let's just dive right into it. Like, do you have any problems with the current ecosystem and can you like talk us through it? Um, I mean, I, I think that there's nothing that I heard Reggie say that isn't true. Um, I, I guess, you know, League of Legends is a, is a, was a great, like, um, introduction to where modern esports is today, right? Like they built a lot of, um, to where we are in this great production value and, and uh, a system where there was money for players and things like that, which is really fantastic. Um, but what feels like has happened is it hasn't kept up. Um, and so you look at things like we were, um, we have a Counter-Strike team as well, and we were at the Valve Major back in March. And, you know, we, we, they sell those stickers in game for a very short period of time. And that's a great revenue stream for just a short period of time. And those kind of opportunities happen, you know, as a great example, and aren't necessarily reflected, you know, in a game like League of Legends. Um, and, you know, we saw Mark talk, of course, about how they're looking at opportunities for next year. And we look forward to those opportunities for sure, because in-game items are a big deal. Um, I would say that uh, as a whole, I, I, I can appreciate both sides a lot, that um, things don't happen quickly in any uh, company structure. I do think change is needed. I think there's a lot of areas, uh, monetization is a really big one, right? And um, uh, you know, not to spark any fires or anything, but it did feel like a very out of touch perspective that Mark had. Um, things like saying that we make enormous amounts of money and that we're just funneling in other games. And I agree with what Reggie said, like League of Legends is not a money maker for us, right? League of Legends is an audience builder and it's a fantastic game. I happen to be a huge League fan as part of what uh, drove me into the game, but it is certainly not this primary driving cash in the organization, um, it tends to take a lot of cash out of the organization, actually, because it's a very expensive game. Yeah. yeah, I love me some League of Legends, for sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about the stickers. Uh, top. I think I made a few to uh, statements over there, too. I talked to a few owners, and to, uh, Monte Cristo, of course, he said that in a short period of time, he was having a Counter-Strike team and a um, League team. He made 10 times more the money that he has of leaks, like of the league icons, you can sell them, and I think 20% goes to the organization, and then the organization can choose what they want to do with the money, but yeah, he made like 10 times more profit from the stickers, from the icons, right? So where could you think that maybe we get like more revenue streams? Do you think that we can like team skins maybe, even though right now team skins are a pretty big topic because they're still reserved for like the champions, right? So it's like maybe there's like a, yeah, a homage to the player goes lost if you do that for like every team, right? So yeah. what's your take? Like how can we, do we have any ideas to get like more revenue out of League right now? Except for broadcasting because I think we can talk about that maybe a bit later then. Sure. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's my area of expertise, certainly, yeah. but uh, certainly it is of people like game developers like Riot. Um, I, I looked at games like Smite, which I think are a perfect example where they've built this ecosystem yeah. where they support the teams. And if you talk to anybody that's in the game of Smite, one of the first things they'll tell you is it's a great game to be in because they have such a strong relationship for helping to develop uh, revenue streams there, you know? Um, and, and I think that's really cool. We're not personally in the game, but I've actually looked at it because I think that's a really great, uh, great thing. And, you know, they have the, um, uh, the team, you know, related skins in that game. I don't know how that would work. You're right. There's a lot of teams. There's a ton of regions, first of all, right? So, uh, you know, what, 50 teams a year without relegation involved across all the, you know, including wildcard regions. Yeah. Um, so that's really challenging. You're right. Um, but something has to be done, right? Because you're talking about an ecosystem that now has viewership that rivals major sports. It now has production quality that rivals ESPN. And yet we're still living in an ecosystem where we're relying so heavily on sponsorship revenue. I mean, think Reggie said a great thing is, can you imagine an, an NFL team, for example, going, well, we're going to build this NFL team, but we're going to have 90% or whatever of our revenue be all sponsor money. I mean, that's a that's a icing on the cake for an NFL team. Uh, my favorite example is if you look at the Green Bay Packers, uh, they're publicly owned, so you can see their revenue streams. They get something like, I think it's 52 or 53% of the revenue is just uh, broadcast rights and revenue share. Uh, and that's before they ever opened a door, sold a piece of merchandise, anything. And... Um, you know, we're being, you know, there's comments about like, well, we'll get more sponsorships, right? Uh, and, and I think the tapped out uh, comment is really interesting, right? Like that the endemics are in a way tapped out. Sure, we're going to get to a place where non endemic is going to come in, right? We're going to get that Doritos or that PepsiCo, whatever it is. Um, and that's going to be great. But if that's the 
the cap on our revenue in this industry, and that's all that's going to drive us. We can never get to that size that that really looks like we have an opportunity for. I mean, 260 million fans already watching, you know, billion dollar industry next year. How do we go there and go beyond with with a primary revenue with the primary revenue stream being sponsors? Yeah. So yeah, you have to know it's one thing for sure that uh, North America has like all nine owners signed. Like one team is still being uh, for up for sale probably, right, for Jack. So Europe doesn't, I think Europe has like with the introduction of the best of two for Europe and the introduction for best of three for NA, I think it kind of showed that Riot is trying to maybe split even the regions. Like it could be like a huge uh, statement right now, but I think that maybe it's time for like NA or Euro to look like different, like a different kind of things, right? So franchising system, of course, right now is a big thing in North America, but you have a European team, even though you're a company from America, right? So do you have like a harder time dealing with like all that kind of uh, stuff as a European team? Like would you ha rather have like a North American team maybe if the chance would be to relocate or would it be easier for you guys to be, be part of the North American LCS in comparison to like Europe? Um, I mean, we personally got into Europe because I believe esports is global, yeah. and so I wanted to have representation across yeah. many regions. You know, for example, our most recent thing is we got in Gears of War in Latin America. You know, so we're trying to get more regions, more fans. So no, I mean, I don't think that going back into North America where you already have four teams makes okay. a lot of sense for us. Um, you, had, you had kind of a few questions in there, so I'll address uh, address them each. Yeah. Um, relegation. I'm I'm in favor of a model, of course, as a businessman that works, you know, that protects my business. So of course, I'd love a slot. But in a, re a relegation system, it's not necessarily a bad thing. But it is if the ecosystem below it doesn't support it. So everyone will go, well, in Europe, you know, the football system has relegation and they do fine, etc. But we all know that the relegation system in football works because when you get relegated, there is a financial stability still down there. When you get relegated to challenger, it is ultimately a death sentence unless you are a massive organization like Schalke, right? Unless you can absorb that blow of all your revenue streams going away because you get sponsorships that literally say, oh, by the way, if you go, if you get relegated, we have the right in our contract to terminate certain rights or to, to lower it down, et cetera. Um, and no other game has that risk, right? I mean, if I'm in Counter-Strike, I'm in Counter-Strike, right? And they're, they're representing us based on our potential and they're not worried about that one particular league. Um, I think the rev the question about splitting the regions is really interesting. Um, you know, we as a group certainly uh, work together, you know, very closely. Um, I, I really love this group of 10 owners, even whether it's Schalke or Misfits. Um, I think all 10, I guess that's 11 owners have, have had a really great relationship. And, you know, we see the opportunity that if you're going to say we're going to split Europe and North America, well, then there's some great things that you can do, like, uh, you know, gambling is a good example, uh, al alcohol sponsorships, things like that that are more um, – you know, more available in, in a European audience than American audiences are, are terrified of because they're not part of culture. You got to be over 21, all these things like that. And, and so, you know, if you're going to have these kind of separate ideas, um, you need to really embrace the European, you know, culture and philosophy. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is um, that the best of two, best of three thing. I was a, a big hater of the whole, oh, best of two, we're getting less game time. I think it's been a really kind of exciting journey because I've learned to love it. Um, and I think it makes us unique, it makes our games different than NA. Um, the fan experience is different, but not bad different. I really enjoyed it and I thought it was really great. Yeah, yeah I think that's a really good insight here. Um, so we have to talk about, uh, of course, broadcasting rights. And you touched on that. I'm not sure if you have to talk about it, but uh, sure. yeah, broadcasting rights is probably like, the next step that is like being discussed right now in case you guys haven't really followed anything, but it's like quite a big deal. So broadcasting rights, that means that all team owners basically get like a piece of the cake that is called uh, the broadcasting rights. So maybe ESPN, they had like a, a rumor of buying the broadcast for right for like 500 million. And then of that 500 million, a small percentage would go to like each owner for like that year of the duration of the broadcast, right? So, but you are probably like a lot more experienced than that. So can you talk us how how much needed or how big it would have like the implications maybe if each owner would have like a small piece of the pie of the big pie that is called the broadcasting rights? Um, I mean, that goes back to my Green Bay Packers comment. So if you're the Green Bay Packers and you have players who are uh, you know, training day in and day out. They've got really a lot of focus on being the absolute best, which is what we want to do. They don't have to also go, well, I've got to do this thing for Budweiser and I've got to do this thing for whatever because they've got to meet so many sponsor requirements because they're so reliant on sponsorship in, in esports, right? Green Bay Packers don't have that. They have a ton of revenue from their uh, broadcast rights, from stadiums, ticket sales, you know, merchandise, et cetera. They're in more advanced revenue streams, basically. But even with advanced revenue streams, broadcast rights is still an enormous portion of those 
those of that money, and it gives you stability, gives you foundation. Um, I think that uh, it opens up the possibility for uh, what we've all been looking for, which is which is a more uh, sustainable model, because yeah. uh, stability means a lot, right? So everyone's worried about this idea that uh, we're helping out the, the bad owners and it's not good for the players, et cetera. But what's amazing about this ecosystem that I think maybe the average fan doesn't realize is it's more money comes in, Fan, we go out and pay more money to the players because we want to get the best players. And then those players uh, are, drive the market below them, right? So, yes, you can be a bad team and not pay, and then your team will be bad and you get relegated out, or you'll just be at the bottom and you won't, you won't do as well, uh, you won't get as good as sponsorships, et cetera. And the, it, it's a, a free market system in a way, and I guess you don't see that a bit from the outside, right? All you see is these, these stories on Reddit, and you think that all the players are being treated poorly, et cetera, probably because the history of esports, right? So much of that has happened in the past. But a, a good thing like broadcast rights, if all of a sudden they're pouring in millions of dollars into all of our teams, the players are going to be able to go out and demand those salaries that I want to pay them, right? I tell every player in my organization, I look forward to the day when I'm signing contracts with them for millions of dollars a year. Because you know what that means? I'm also making millions of dollars a year. And I would much rather that circumstance than we're all you know down at the bottom just yeah. scraping some sponsor dollars, et cetera. Um, and, and broadcast rights is a big thing. Uh, I mean, even college, college sports, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for broadcast rights, and their viewership is nothing compared to what we have, you know? Um, and I'd say that the key thing, though, is to say that it's not it's not the entire puzzle because people will talk broadcast rights, franchising, broadcast rights, franchising, and they are big. But in order for this ecosystem to get stabilized, we need to look at all the different revenue streams. You know, we, we just talked about in-game items. That's a small portion of usage of, usage of our intellectual property, right? There's massive opportunity there. And, uh, I mean, you just look at the, the press that's here for this event. It tells you the kind of hunger over esports yeah. from all these different press outlets that are here that two years ago you never would have seen at this event, you know? Um, so I think there's a ton of opportunity for us to grow to having 20, 30 revenue streams, like a traditional sports franchise, instead of two, three, maybe four, which is where we're struggling. Yeah. Are you a fan of like the ATB, like the tennis style system, the circuit points? Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah, right. Big tennis can you, fan. Big tennis fan? Yeah. So can you talk to us? Maybe like in a perfect world, we can please both things and have like an NFL over in North America. And in Europe, we still use that circuit point. That would mean, circuit points means that we have third party involved, hosting tournaments, like all the good stuff, multiple IEM events and everything. But uh, what would you like to have like a system like that maybe in place even? For like the challenger scene, for example, to have like a more stable second league? I mean, I think definitely for Challenger, we need something. Um, number one, developing talent. You know, we were one of those teams where we picked up a rookie three months ago, uh, Mickey, and it turns out, even though this kid had never stepped on a stage in his life, he handled it really well. Probably terrified the first time he did it, but got better at it. And, and it's been great, the split, and came very close to winning rookie of the split. And that's not always the case, right? Plenty of these rookies get up there and fail uh, because they don't get the chance to develop in a good system. Um, and Challenger right now, sitting at home in your bedroom and playing some games and then eventually making LCS, that's a giant leap, right? That's like the leap of, of the guys who went from high school to, uh, to straight to the NBA. And rarely did that work out back in the day for that exact reason. It was too big of a jump. They made a lot of mistakes along the way, um, and it's rare people can do that. I think that's certainly important for Challenger. As far as the more global scene, like you're talking at the LCS level, I think there's lots of opportunity. Yeah. Um, one of the more recent ones I, I thought about is, uh, you know, look, you look at the NBA. I'm a big NBA fan as well, and what's really great about NBA is there's no NBA day, it's NBA season, or baseball, it's baseball season, right? And there are games every day. And what's really cool about that is as a fan, you aren't feeling like you have to sit for 12, 14 hours every Saturday to watch content. Instead, you can sit and watch a game or two a day and maybe pick the games throughout the week you want to catch. And I'm being a big San Antonio Spurs fan, I would check my schedule for the week and go, okay, they're playing Tuesday and Friday, right? I'm gonna try and catch one of those games. And, and that's, I think, a way to drive more, uh, or a way, it's not the way, that's the great thing, right? There is no one way, and I kind of love that about esports, since we're kind of developing this as we go. Yeah. Um, we have opportunity to test things, like best of two, best of three, right? Um, I just hope that along the way we get opportunities to uh, really evaluate everything and, and go, this worked, this didn't, let's try something new and, and find the right one. All right, I think that's enough insights. I'm not gonna bore you with more esports talk, but I, I think it's really important to have this discussion, of course, with uh, the European side because we're one half of the LCS and we need a uh, we need to talk about that too. So, 
Let's talk about bit about your team, a bit more personal stuff. First time in Poland, right? How are you enjoying it? It is beautiful. Yeah. So I've never been here before. Um, I have Polish roots, and uh, I was really excited because it's not a country. I, I, it's like you know a little more off to the off to the side of the Central Europe, um, and it's gorgeous weather, gorgeous country, and the venue is amazing. So really, it's it was like a moment. Like I walked in front of the venue for the first time and went, "Splice is going to play in that massive place." Yeah. And really cool. Yeah. So of course, uh, you guys had a team last split that was a uh, bring of relegation, and then now you're playing in the final. I think that's a really cool thing about Europe that we don't have like these giants historically. We have like sw we we switch our things right. When I was playing, we had like a first place team disappeared. Then the new team comes, G2. They make first place. They're suddenly the best team in Europe, and we have like all these changes. Do you think uh, like would you have expected your team like your your Danes to be like in the final right now of the split? Yes. 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 So, um, y you know, people say I planned for it. It's easy to say afterward, right? <laughs> um, but it's not about me, right? It's about uh, Yamato. So Jacob and I sat down very early back in December, January, when we were first talking, working together, and we had these incredibly long phone calls, realizing we had very similar philosophies yeah. on how to work in this. And one of the things was, is you don't just slap five players together and go, oh, you're all good at these roles. Uh, oh, you're a coach. You can coach them, right? Yeah. Um, come from traditional sports. I mentioned the San Antonio Spurs. They play Greg Popovich basketball, right? Yeah. And so when they get players, they go, well, will this player fit into the Greg Popovich system? And so part of as we were working with these players is, number one, they started going, okay, mechanically, they're all gifted, very gifted mechanical players. But Jacob went, let's tear down your way you think about the global game of League of Legends and teach you how to play the team game or my style of game, which is you know Jacob's style of game, uh, your motto. And I think that's amazing to have your print on a game like that because there's a million ways you can play League of Legends, right? There's no right or wrong, and we continue to learn every single split new ways no one ever thought of. Yeah. The European lane swap, right? Yeah. Who would have ever imagined a year ago that was going to exist? Yeah. Um, and that, that's really exciting to me. And But what was great is we got to the end of the first split uh, and we talked about okay this is where we wanted to be we saw improvement every single week we fought with the best we had their fan big fanatic win we took g2 right to the brink at the very you know last week of the season we're like we're ready to go into season two you know we made one change but we were not there was no panic which i know a lot of people do in that scenario oh you're an allegation we said these are the right guys they're still learning the system and we saw it again we got in the season it was a little shaky at first but you saw immediate improvement week after week yeah. and so by midway through the split I knew we were a playoff team. By a couple weeks later, I knew we were a real threat in the playoffs. And by the time we hit the end of the season, I knew we had a really shot, real shot at Worlds. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, tomorrow, it's pretty important. I, I mean, I think H2K just won, so that means that you oh, still... I think it's over. Yeah. I mean, I hear just some noise, so I assume <laughs> it's over, right? So that means for you, um, it's not safe for you to go to Worlds. You still have to play tomorrow. Either you win. If you lose, you still have to play through Gauntlet. Mm -hmm. If not, you would have probably made it through points, right? Or how, how was it there? Like so if, if Unicorns won today, yeah. uh, we automatically, if yeah. we win tomorrow, yeah. we're in, and then the gauntlet, of course. Um, you know, because as, as, again, a philo philosophical thing, we don't look too far ahead. Yes, we're excited by Worlds, but really we're focused on one game, right, which is tomorrow's game. And jokingly, of course, there were lots of, ah, oh, Unicorns win today, right, chance for Unicorns, yeah. et cetera. Uh, but it was always about tomorrow's game anyway. Um, and, you know, tomorrow's game, I have really good expectations that we have a, a really good shot at winning. But whether or not we do, uh, game by game, I think we always have a shot. And I don't ever build teams to be middle of the pack, right? That's not a goal for us as an organization, and I hope it's not for most organizations. Uh, so going in, the expectation is whether we got gauntlet or not, it yeah. doesn't matter. We still go, in, go in and beat those teams, yeah. you know? Yeah, of course. Uh, to keep it short, you guys, if you go to Worlds, last question, um, are you going to boot camp in Korea like the rest? Uh, I think it's too soon to answer that kind of question until we're qualified for Worlds. Yeah. Again, one step at a time. I want to win the European Championship first, right? right. Let's hope you uh, lift that trophy tomorrow. Yeah. Best of luck to your team and, of course, to you. And thank you so much for this insight. I think it was really, really like good, detailed uh, response for that. Thank you so much for the time. And yeah, if you guys want to check out more stuff, uh, thescoreesports.com. We have the interviews with all the owners. We're going to ask a few more this weekend, probably what they are thought or like insight is on the scene and yeah thank you so much for watching and see you guys next time